Hello and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history in 20-minute espresso shot episodes, served with a dash of personality. I am your host, Hazel Baker, London tour guide and CEO of London Guided Walks, providing private tours, treasure hunts, guided walks and live London quizzes to Londoners and visitors alike. Don't forget to accompany this podcast. We also have really great show notes, including pictures and this time a map. We have London history related blog posts for you to enjoy absolutely free. And of course, now we have the Daily London, providing you with a couple of minutes of daily inspiration for things to do in London for Londoners. You can listen on iTunes, Spotify, add it to your Alexa flash briefings. All the information you need is on our website, londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash flash. One of my favourite things about doing this podcast is your recommendations of things that we should be covering. And Mavis got in touch and asked for one about London's post boxes, or of course they're called pillar boxes. And in order to do that, I thought I'd get an expert involved. Joining me in the studio today is Joanna Espin, curator of the Postal Museum. So thank you, Joanna, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Hi there. So, Joanna, if you're curator of the Postal Museum, what does a curator do? Yeah, that's right. So, basically, it's my job to work with the collections team to look after the collection and share stories about postal history, basically. It's a 500-year-old story of communication through the post. So, you're perfect for today's episode, then? I hope so. (laughs) I'll do my best. (laughs) So did you want to um, share with us uh, about uh, pillar boxes and and why they were introduced? Yeah, that seems like a good place to start. So the introduction of pillar boxes is linked to the 1840 Penny Post Revolution in Communications, which saw the cost of posting a letter reduced to a penny. Before that, the system had been quite complicated and expensive And ultimately, after 1840 and this revolution in the postal pricing system, many, many more letters were were posted. So before 1840, if you wanted to post a letter, you could either take it to a letter receiving house, which it could be miles away from where you lived, or you could hand your letter to a bellman, who was literally a man with a bell and a bag, and he'd stand and ring the bell and collect letters. But when the scale of posting letters increased dramatically, there needed to be some new system to deal with this. And Anthony Trollope, who's best known as a Victorian novelist, um, but he was actually also employed by the post office for over 30 years. He had seen pillar boxes in use when travelling on the continent. And he suggested that there was a trial of pillar boxes in this country as a system for dealing with this new, larger amount of mail being sent. So that changed things quite dramatically, didn't it? Because if you think of like the Jane Austen films that you see and the uh, the, 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 the the nightmen on their and their horses and they're whizzing and then they sort of fly off the horse and knock on the door and Mr. Bennett gives them some money uh, and he always looks a bit begrudging <laughs> by giving him the, the, the money. And of course, they, they, they're they the ones that had to, if, if you're receiving the post, you, you had to pay for it. Yeah, so that was another big change in 1840. So... Prior to the penny post, it was, say, if I was writing a letter to you, I'd write my letter, send it in the mail, and then you would be the one to pay to receive it, as opposed to me paying to post it to you. So after 1840, one of the major changes was that the person actually sending the letter would pay for the postage. And um, as it says on the tin, it was a penny post, it cost a penny. And um, that, that was another really big change, that it became a lot more accessible for people to to send mail. Um, previously, the cost was worked out based on the number of sheets of paper used and also the distance travelled. And it was quite complicated and complex and expensive. People did all sorts of things to try and get round um, some of the costs. So, for example, you might cross write your letter, which was you'd write in one direction, turn the paper over write in the other direction, turn the paper over again, write in another direction. They're really difficult to read, but you'd use sheets of paper, so it would cost less to receive. Okay, so um, Anthony Trollope's made this suggestion, and when was the first pillar box trial then? Was it in London? So the first pillar box trial was outside of London, and it happened on the Channel Islands, um, in Jersey, actually, in 1853. 
And um, the second trial was also in the Channel Islands, this time on Guernsey. And one of these boxes from this second trial is still on use on the island today. And we have the other side. Yeah, so it's amazing that it's like a living piece of history. And mm-hmm. and the second uh, survivor of that trial is actually in the collection at the Postal Museum. So that one is in London. It's one of the only two surviving oldest pillar boxes in the country in our collection. Oh, that's really quite amazing, isn't it? So I have seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> you can tick that one off your list. <laughs> and come on, you've got to be able to tell me now, why, why were they read? Were they read from the very beginning? Yes. So the early pillar boxes, um, they were red in colour. So that was the first colour of pillar boxes. Apparently, it was suggested that they could have been a chocolate brown colour. But sources in our archives suggest that that would have required extra varnish. So it would have cost more money. So perhaps red was chosen because of its apparent uh, cheapness as as opposed to other colours that might be available. But Mm -hmm. there was a change in the colour of uh, pillar boxes because they were painted green. So after 1859, the standardised colour was green. Um, And there's some research that we've done about the the exact shade of green they might have been and that they were treated with a bronzing technique. So exactly Mm -hmm. what shade of green they would have looked is a little bit difficult for us to piece together from the records we have in the archive. And Obviously, we don't have full of photographs to refer to, but there mm. is suggestion that the green boxes were difficult to find, especially in rural areas. So you oh, they just blended in. Yeah, you've got like <laughs> green fields and green hedges, and then is that a green tree? No, it's a green pillar box. So the green colour was phased out. Um, there was a return to red from 1874, and it took 10 years to complete that programme of repainting um, because they didn't just set out and repaint every single pillar box immediately. It was it was phased. So for a, a decade or so, you would have had red and green pillar boxes on the streets at the same time. And, in, and if you were going to recommend some um, pillar boxes for, for people to have a little day out in London, uh, what would be your, your top ones to see? So I'd recommend that people... Um, go and see a pillar box which is on St Martin's Le Grand. So it's not far from St Paul's Cathedral and it looks like an old pillar box but actually it's quite new and it's masquerading as something much older. It's a replica of a Victorian Penfold post box. So Penfold, the box gets its name from its designer J.W. Penfold and he was an architect and the box um, was first erected in 1866 the Victorian pillar box and it was one of the attempts to standardise the design of pillar boxes across the country and it's different from what we would associate with the standard shape of a pillar box today because it's hexagonal shape so that's quite a big design difference and it's got a number of decorative balls going around the top of it so if you want to impress your friends with some Inside a post box identification skills, you can tell the size of a, p- a penfold by counting its decorative balls. So if it's got nine balls across the front of the box, it means it's a small penfold. But if you count ten balls across the front, it means it's a large penfold. So that's a little insider tip. Ooh. I say. So <laughs> nine balls along the front is a small penfold and ten balls means it a large. So what is the one on St. Martin's Le Grand, do you know? That is a very fine question. And I will leave it to your listeners <laughs> to find that out. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Nice one. Nice answer. Yeah. And, and we will be posting some uh, pictures of uh, the, the post boxes that we're talking about on the show notes as well. So if you go to londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast, and I've taken, uh, uh, I just take photos of post boxes anyway. I think they're beautiful. And so uh, you'll be able to have a look at some of those. And- and you said that this was a new Penfold pillar box. Yes, it was unveiled by Prince Charles in 2016, so just a few years ago. And it was part of the commemorations of Royal Mail's 500th anniversary of the founding of the post office. And so the the company and, and the, the postal service has its origins way back in the 16th century when Henry VIII appointed Brian Tuke as the first 
postmaster. So, so this this commemorative box was all part of those celebrations, and it's located in an important part of London's postal past. So, and um, Saint Martin's Le Grand was the site of the GPO headquarters from 1829, and the building was actually demolished in 1912. Um, but but the site is still quite important in the in the history of the post office. Yeah, so you've got GPO, which is the for the listeners of General Post Office, and I suppose this one then, Jono, is the the only I'll say copy replica that we have. Uh, well, a, it looks like a, a normal post box, but it also has the VR on, so Victoria Regina, which of course, even though it was put up during Elizabeth's time, yeah. So that's quite unusual. It would tend to be that if the pill, when the pillar box is being manufactured you would have the cipher of the ruling monarch on the pillar box. But these penfolds are actually in conservation areas. So some certain areas of the country have been allowed to have pillar boxes, um, which are for conservation reasons, Victorian in style. And often you'll see a little plaque at the bottom to just to say that it, it's a pillar box which has been given this special dispensation but usually the pillar box would have the the ruling monarch cipher on it and that's a really great way of being able to tell the date of a pillar box because you'll be able to look at the cipher and you'll know well if it's that monarch it's from this period this is a really beautiful um, uh, pillar box. It's, as um, Joanna said, it's, it's dark green, but it's got beautiful uh, gold decoration as well. So it's rather, rather smart. And then also a couple of steps away is uh, Roland Hill, the statue there. And that is a talking statue. So you can scan the QR code uh, by a QR code reader, or um, if you've got an iOS device, you can just take a photo of it and it will then take you to the website and you can have uh, Roland Roland Hill talk to you. And he was the driving force behind the Penny Post Revolution. He was a social reformer. So a really important person in the history of the post office. And yeah, it's great that you can hear more and bring this statue to life like that. It's a really lovely project. So Joanna, what's your second recommendation for pillar boxes in London to see? Yeah, so the second pillar box I'd recommend people go and see is is much to soak up the area and the history of the area as the box itself um, because it commemorates the first pillar boxes placed in London. So London received its first pillar boxes in 1855 on five streets. So the first streets to have pillar boxes in London were Fleet Street, Strand, Piccadilly, Pall Mall and Rutland Gate. So I'd suggest that you could go and see the pillar box on Fleet Street. So it isn't one of the very first London pillar boxes, but it's on the street where the first pillar box boxes were sighted. And it was given a special plaque commemorating the 1855 introduction of pillar boxes, and it was installed on the bicentenary of Anthony Trollope. So again, when you look at this box on Fleet Street, you'll be able to see Queen Victoria's cipher, and it's got cursive BR lettering. So again, that's a great way to be able to tell the date of a, of a post box. And people get really into cipher spotting, so some of them are more rare than others, and there's also few boxes around London which don't have a cipher at all, and that was because of an oversight, basically, it just uh, they forgot to put them on certain boxes, and they're known as anonymous boxes, and there's one of those in Blackheath. Right, next time I'm in Blackheath, I'll put that one on the list. I have a, a, a taxi driving friend and he said that uh, and one lady um, paid him basically to drive round to to see particular pillar boxes. Uh, she had a, a, a long checklist and uh, so he was with her for the whole day taking around London, um, seeing all these things. So, was and she, you know, just made her day. Yeah. Was it a holiday she was on or? Yeah, yeah, she was from the States and, you know, you've only got a certain amount of time to, you know, to do everything. And so she had dedicated one day to pillar box hunt in London. Oh, wow. One of the rarer types of pillar box ciphers is the Edward VIII um, cipher. Yes. So you can see one of those display in the museum, but I've heard of people who make it their, you know, their mission to go out and see all of the Edward VIII pillar boxes that are out there. I think across the whole country, there's only a, a, a 
about 150 or so. So they are quite rare. Well, that might give me a new project. (laughs) And all these boxes, well, they're quite big, aren't they? So were there any smaller post boxes in Victoria, London? Yeah, there were. So towards the end of the 19th century, um, there was more demand, more and more demand for convenient posting facilities for London squares. So the kind of affluent squares around which influential residents of London would have lived. So smaller mm-hmm. boxes were designed um, basically just to take small letters and they were designed to attach to lamp posts and they were known as lamp boxes. And they were introduced in London from about 1897. Then they started to be introduced across the country and were removed from London squares. So it's not a type of box you'll see on your walks around London today. And and what about the the third pillar box you'd recommend for for people to see in London? Um, So lastly, I'd recommend people go to Westminster and see the gold-painted pillar box there, which commemorates London as the host city of the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And that one commemorates London as the host city of the Games, as opposed to, again, being for a specific uh, sportsman or woman. It's commemorating the whole of the Games. Our listeners are spread all across the UK and indeed the world. But for the UK listeners, if you have a gold letterbox in your town, then do let us know. So we've covered red, green and gold pillar boxes. Any other colours? And then you have airmail boxes in the 1930s, which were this kind of sky blue, a pale, bright blue. That was part of the 1930s move into PR, where... This blue colour was tied into the uniforms and the vehicles to really push airmail as a new service. Mm -hmm. And most recently this year, several post boxes have been painted blue as a thank you to the NHS during the pandemic. So it's a different shade of blue from the airmail boxes. It's the blue you'd see on the NHS logo, a a deeper dark blue. Mm -hmm. And one of those thank you to the NHS post boxes is situated outside St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And that's the hospital uh, in which the Prime Minister was treated for coronavirus. So the story of pillar boxes in London is still evolving today. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, that's I think that's going to be a, a, my new hobby now, John, is uh, m- mapping them all out, my, my, my recent discoveries. There's so much to see, Lo- so many different styles um, and also uh, the different colours as well. So the airmail boxes are this dreamy shade of blue. Uh, are there any in London or have they been all post um, repainted red? So to the best of my knowledge, they have been repainted red, but you can see a blue airmail pillar box on display in the gallery at the Postal Museum. And we researched the colour to get the exact shade of blue, which would have been used in the 1930s. And we researched that in the archive at the Postal Museum. So, yeah, you'll be able to see one of those when you come and visit the museum. How wonderful. Big thank you, Joanna, for taking the time to share your in-depth knowledge and passion for all things postal. And everybody, the Postal Museum is now open. You're able to get there. A very short walk from Harrington Station. Um, and they have a wonderful exhibition at the moment, The Great Train Robbery, a Crime and the Post. And this is exploring one of the most audacious crimes of the 20th century and the subsequent investigation. And that's alongside other stories of crime through the post so it's worth a checking that out before that ends at the end of december this year all the information from today's show and also information about the postal museum which is a really fabulous day out and i've added photos and a map of all the polar boxes that joanna was talking about on our website and you can check those out and go exploring in your own time Don't forget to share your London explorations with us by tagging us on social media. It'd be lovely to see what you're up to. That's all for now. I'll catch you next time. (laughs) 